Uh, the following interview was conducted with Professor with Raymond Cohen, Herrick Professor Emeritus of Mechanical Engineering, Purdue University, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, July the 15th, 2008, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. And tell us a little bit about your where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Oh, my. <clears throat> well, um, I was born in St. Louis, Missouri. Okay. Both my mother and my father were immigrants. They both came uh, as youths. And um, Did they settle then when they came? They in settled in St. Louis because they had previous family who had come. My mother was born in England, uh, essentially on the way, because she her family background is Eastern Europe. My father was born in Romania. And he came uh, where his older brother lived in St. Louis, and that was how the family got started in St. Louis. Um, and I went to school in St. Louis. Okay. What was grade school like? Was it large or small? It was relatively small. It was in the north part of St. Louis, a relatively small school. In fact, <clears throat> I used to think that the kindergarten room was huge when I was there. And I went back, uh, you know, when I was... Uh, a little older, and I couldn't believe how small it was. <laughs> but I understand that's commonplace. So I graduated from uh, University City High School, which was uh, a little suburb right by uh, Washington University. So that's how it got its name. And um, what was high school like? Tell us a little bit about that. It was how large? Well, was I started class? at a at a high school now, which is. Uh, more in the center of the city, called Soldan High School. And um, uh, I was more or less a commuter because I lived right on the edge of the, bet between our high school area and another one. Uh, and I used to go to work, uh, go to school, when my father went to work and he dropped me off because it was a little bit far to walk. And I would go home on a streetcar, back when they had streetcars in St. Right, Louis. Okay. Um, and if you want to know what those look like, you go back to the to the movie Meet Me in St. Louis with Judy right. Garland. That was a wonderful movie. Uh, at any rate, um, I did reasonably well in uh, the sciences and especially in uh, high school mathematics back at that time. Transferred to University City High School when the family moved to University City. And I decided eventually to become an engineer. Um, had uh, became under the influence of a of a of a fellow who was already studying engineering here at Purdue and was a part of a family that was close to my my family. So he had a big influence on my life. He brought me to Purdue essentially. He said, "If you come, you can join the same fraternity I belong to," and and that was my start. And that was in 1941. Okay. And during the first semester is when Pearl Harbor. Right. And so I didn't even finish the first semester as planned and as started back at that time. Uh, what happened? I, when I went home for um, uh, Christmas vacation, and at that time we had uh, final exams after Christmas right. vacation before we started the second semester. And um, and I went home with a suitcase full of books because I didn't think I knew anything, much less everything. Uh, but I got a, a letter at home during Christmas vacation that says, the semester is essentially over. You're not, not going to have any more uh, final exams. And when you come back, you're going to start the second semester. So we went here at Purdue into a three semester per year, three full semesters. Which the summer was kind of as a semester. The summer was like a 16 week semester, 16, 18, I've forgotten exactly. And um, so with that speed up program, we had the, uh, <coughs> uh, had the opportunity to, to uh, uh, finish school before uh, we left Purdue to uh, go to the Army. So at that time, they started uh, the AST, 
ASTP program, Army Specialized Training Program, and the V-12 program for the Navy, which was the equivalent, things of this kind. And, uh, and I decided uh, to join the ASTP program. And at that time, they said we could uh, expect to finish in a speed-up program. And from there, we would go to officer school because we would then be professional engineers and so forth. Well, uh, never worked out that way, did not work out that way. Instead, um, uh, they called me. Let's see, I finished actually five semesters of schooling in a couple of years. And, uh, That's pretty intensive. Oh, it was very intensive. We only had a week between semesters. Mm -hmm. Where were you living on campus? Were you in a fraternity? Or? I, I lived in a fraternity on Waldron Street that doesn't exist anymore okay. uh, here at Purdue. And, uh, and I became president of the, the fraternity the last semester I was here. Uh, and uh, people were going right and left from this. The fraternity kept getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> And uh, after I left, it didn't last more than a semester or two when it had to close down because they didn't have enough students. Uh, the students in engineering at Purdue became mostly people in the, either the V-12 program or another one of the, um, of the military programs. Uh, I went to, uh, I was supposed to go when I, I got the call to come to duty and they sent me to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Uh, where uh, I did my basic training in the field artillery because at that time, in fact, uh, the Army program here at Purdue was required for all undergraduates and they were all in field artillery. We did field artillery stuff. That changed later, but uh, when I left Purdue, that's what it, the way it was. And um, uh, I was trained uh, in to do something that you may or may not even know the name of, I became a theodolite operator. I don't even know that most people don't know what a theodolite is. It's a type of uh, surveying instrument uh, which not only goes around with the barrel that you look through, the, but it can go up to and down as well. And it was um, to follow a balloon that you with hydrogen that you you sent up in the air to see what the air currents were at the different levels. Wow. And um, uh, I, I, that was very interesting training because I couldn't do it in the beginning. You had to have one eye on the balloon and kept the crosshairs on the balloon as it went up. And the other eye you had to read the dials, what the azimuth and what the elevation sure. were. But I got to do that. And the reason for that was for the large artillery they would correct for the air currents at the different levels so that they had a chance of hitting their, their target. objective, the target. Yeah. But uh, because uh, I was signed up for this ASTP program, uh, I went, uh, I was sent after I finished my basic training uh, to the University of Idaho in Moscow, Idaho. And I'll never forget when I called my mother and said, uh, I'm going to Moscow. I thought she was going to drop right then and there. I said, Moscow, Idaho, not Russia. <laughs> but, uh, I can just see her picture, the expression on her face. Oh, you, you got it right on the butt. <laughs> At any rate, um, uh, I spent uh, not quite a year in that, that University of Idaho, a lovely place. I, recommend the campus is right in the nestled right in the, the mountains uh, very lovely and uh, and I picked up some more engineering credits uh, but then uh, the war changed and we started to win some battles and so the need for uh, what I had signed up for became minimal and most of the people who were at my age level ASTP uh, we went everywhere in the Army, and I wound up in California in what was called a Light Infantry Division. <clears throat> and um, we were supposed to be, a, we had one Jeep to the company. That's how light, everything else was on the back. And we were being trained to go into the jungle or into mountains. To, we were 
like, like a special forces kind of thing. And uh, 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 I really didn't appreciate that assignment very much, so I applied for officer school yet again, which I was supposed to do when, when I was an uh, uh, advanced student here at Purdue before I went in in the first place. And they accepted me and uh, even took my rifle away, and I'm ready to go when the Battle of the Bulge came. 1944? Yeah, and, and that changed everything. Uh, so they gave me back the rifle, attached me to a company. They said, uh, you're needed in Europe and now. So we, uh, the company they attached me to was part of a regular infantry division, shipped to the East Coast, and we prepared in just a few months to join the Battle of the Bulge. And that winter, Christmas time, we were shipped overseas. By ship? Uh, by ship. And I was uh, at the advanced uh, uh, rank of private first class <laughs> going overseas. <laughs> but uh, I was lucky and uh, and uh, I got through with, without a Purple Heart. But uh, if you saw Saving Private Ryan, you would know that uh, at the end of the war we were going from town to town, and, and that's the kind of uh, thing I saw because I got over there at the end of the Battle of the Bulge, the really difficult. And, it was already over the it big... Was, it was pretty much over, and our division was attached to Patton when he was zipping through southern Germany. And I read, I rode on one of his tanks as an infantryman and saw a lot of stuff. And that was all behind me at the end of the war, but I didn't have enough points to come home after the E-Day. And uh, uh, so I was part of the uh, crew at first that uh, <clears throat> was, you might say, occupation force in southern Germany and in Austria, and there for a while. And eventually uh, they put me back uh, in Camp Lucky Strike because most of the infantrymen were, did not have as much education as I had, etc. And I became a good person to to work in the office processing papers for those who had enough points to come back. So that's how I finished my Army career, doing that kind of thing, and finally I had enough points to come back. Okay. A little interesting anecdote is, uh, uh, again I applied for officer school, and again I was accepted while I was in France doing this processing. Uh, and then the first atomic bomb dropped while I was doing that kind of work. In fact, I was on a week of uh, leave down in Nice, France. Lovely thing. I didn't know that anybody could make GI food taste so good as those French cooks in the, in the hotels, <laughs> the vacation hotels in southern France. But that was a great time. But, but that's when the information came over the radio that the, the bomb had dropped, and you could see the end of the war immediately. And I'll tell you, there were no GIs that I came in contact with who were not, who were, who were anti-nuclear. Uh, we were all happy as, as you could be. But um, uh, I came back home after that, and well, before I came home, I went to the Master Sergeant in the Personnel Department, I said, you know those papers for going to, to, to officer school? You can tear those up. I'm not going anymore. <laughs> I've anyway, done that's my, my Army experience. I've probably told you more than you need to know. No, but that's, that's good. How did, then, when, what happened when you got back? Did you come back by ship as well? Came back by ship. Yeah. It was better coming back because by then I was a sergeant. Oh, okay. Going over, I, I was down doing KP. I remember one day I... They gave me uh, a, a big, what did they call those GI cans full of onions to peel onions. And I didn't realize, but after a while, your eyes stopped tearing. There's <laughs> nothing to tear, I guess. <laughs> I've heard stories like that. <laughs> so I, I went through that period. But coming back, I was already a, 
uh, non-commissioned officer. He and moved up I, in the It rank. was a lot more fun coming back sure. than going over for lots of reasons. That was one of them. Yeah. So I came back, and I went back uh, home and stayed there till the next semester started at Purdue and came back here. Uh, uh, had, uh, I only had uh, a couple of semesters to go to get my degree because I had credits from going to the University of Idaho. Oh, okay. And uh, so I finished up uh, here. Uh, I met a, a gal that uh, looked like we were going to get married, so I didn't know what to do, and I had all kinds of interests. And I fell under the influence of uh, Professor Zucro, who is uh, someone that, uh, that you should have been able to interview, but he's long gone. And, uh, and he said, you have good grades. He says, why don't you stay? So that influenced me to stay for a master's in a PhD program, mm -hmm. uh, which I did. This and was in mechanic. Are you in mechanical in engineering? Mechanical engineering. Okay. And uh, and Harry Solberg was head of mechanical engineering at the at the time. I don't know if you knew him, but uh, uh, we farmed. A, we had a good relationship with each other, and uh, one of the men who uh, was on the faculty. Uh, running a vibrations lab, which is what I was becoming an expert in, uh, he uh, decided to become a head of a department at the University of Rochester. And he had this lab that was well developed. Harry Solberg said to me, uh, if you stay, I'll give you an assistant professorship, <clears throat> and uh, you can have that laboratory. I, after he offered that, I didn't even look anywhere else right. for a job. Because it fits so in with I your took research over, area. took over that lab, which eventually led to research and lots of nice things. Uh, and that, that, was, that was great. Mm -hmm. Now we'll turn to, let's talk a little bit about Herrick uh, Labs. Can you tell me about the background and then your sure. affiliation with it? Yeah, I'm not sure I can tell you the exact dates, but the Herrick, well, I it guess. It says, according to I things I read, it was established around the 1950s, but the building today was dedicated in 1960 as the Herrick Labs over there. Well, yeah. this is our 50th anniversary as a laboratory mm -hmm. in that building. The building originally was built as a harsh barn. That I And uh, the I animal that. scientists had that building. Correct. And uh, you know, they had the, it's a standard looking barn with the high roof part of the main, main part of the barn. And then at the end was the low level where they had all of the stalls for the, the harshes that they were doing studies with. Um, uh, and Bill Fontaine, who was the first director of the Herrick Labs, uh, which was the first engineering use of the building when he became director, uh, uh, he used to, to say, I have the chief stallion stalls for my office. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> and he was right. That's what it was. Yeah. And eventually I moved in. But the reason it's the Herrick Lab there instead of still an old barn is that uh, about uh, just before that, there were two professors of mechanical engineering uh, by the name of uh, Miller and, and Venom. And one taught refrigeration and the other taught air conditioning. And they both retired about the same time. Uh, they were well-known props in the in industry in those fields, and uh, Harry Solberg uh, decided to combine those two areas and get one professor. And I don't know the economics of the situation that he faced, but instead of advertising, and that was before you had to advertise and you had to have committees, and the, all the head had to do was find somebody and get approval from the dean, and he was hired, you know, that kind of thing. And Harry Solberg went to uh, uh, to Bill Fontaine, who was teaching thermodynamics at the time, and said, how would you like to have this this area? And Bill said, I don't know anything about that area. He says, uh, so I'm not sure I want that job. And Harry said, no problem. He said, we have an alumnus by, uh, who, who is a partner of Ray Herrick at Tecumseh Products Company. And at that time, Tecumseh Products Company made over half 
of the compressors in the world for refrigerators and window air conditioners and things like that, the small ones. And he said, uh, I'm going to introduce you uh, to this guy, and he will arrange to have you go up to Tecumseh, Michigan, and spend the summer there, and you can learn everything about refrigeration. Well, Bill went up there. I don't know if you want some of these anecdotes or not. It's okay, but, go ahead. Yeah. But uh, it's in that little book that I gave you in his memoirs, uh, which he wrote uh, after he retired. When I was department head for a short period of time, uh, I had a, a, a gal who was very good at this, and I assigned her part-time to work with him and to come up with this, because at that time he couldn't, couldn't see well enough to, sure. to do anything. Uh, so he went up there that summer, and they didn't know what to do with him. They never had anybody there working <laughs> like that before. But they put him in what was then a, a small, uh, relatively large room, which uh, served the dual purpose of being a library for them and a conference room. And they put an office desk in that big room and said, here's where you can be. And he puts a sign on the door that says, Bill Feintain, Professor of Mechanical Engineering, um, I'm here to consult with you. Bring your problem. Well, uh, engineers would, the way he tells it, and he tells some of this in, in his memoirs, he, uh, he uh, uh, started to get guys coming in with their problems, and he said, I didn't know anything about what they were talking about, but I would ask him, what's your problem? And, tell me about it, and they'd tell him, and then he said I would ask them, uh, what are you going to do about it? And they'd say, well, I'm thinking about this, or I'm thinking about that. He says, great idea. Why don't you try it? Go. And they loved him for because he <laughs> agreed with them. And, and, uh, <laughs> he had the right style to handle he it. He had the right style for that. <laughs> and uh, at any rate, uh, during that period of time, he met a lot of people. And he met Ray Herrick, who was at that time the president of the company. Had, was he a Purdue grad? Ray Herrick didn't even graduate high school. Okay. But he, found, he had founded the company? He founded the company. He was a, uh, probably the best tool and die maker that Henry Ford ever had. And Henry Ford loaned him the money to start this company. And he built it up, as mm. I said, this way. You remember? You may remember the old round top refrigerators. I think that Frigidaire made those things, and Ray and they supplied not only those refrigerators, but they supplied all the compressors to all the other companies making refrigerators. Wow! At the time, and when Ray Herrick built his first compressors, he put them out of the compressor business because he made them cheaper and more reliable. And uh, so that's how big it was. And uh, just went on from there. It just went on from there. But anyway, he met Ray Herrick, and when he was saying his goodbyes to come back to Purdue, uh, he left Ray Herrick for last. And he went into Ray Herrick's office and said, "I'm leaving. I've had a good time, and you know all of those kind of platitudes." Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and Ray Herrick said, well, when you get back to Purdue, what are you going to do? And he says, well, the only thing I can do is go back to teach in thermo, and I'll probably teach some refrigeration and air conditioning as well. He said, but Bill Fontaine I'm talking about said, but what I'd like to do is I'd like to start a research laboratory that would benefit this industry. And he had a... Uh, a resonance with, with Ray Herrick, and Ray Herrick said, I think the amount of money, and this was 50 years ago, he said, uh, he said uh, I want to give you $300,000 to get started. Yeah, I read that. Yeah. And uh, that's how the Herrick Lab started. And he said to Bill Fontaine, what do I do next? And Bill said, well, he said, you can pick up that telephone and call President Hovde at Purdue and tell him you're going to do this. And Ray Herrick did it. So when when Bill came back to the campus, all he had to do was pick up the telephone to the president of the university and say, I guess you heard I'm getting $300,000 to start a, a uh, an engineering research lab. And that start, that's what started 
And, um, uh, President How Hadley did they have, happen to pick that site, though? Did they have that? Well, that's my oh. next point. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you anticipated yeah. correctly. Uh, 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 Fred Hudley called in R.B. Stewart and told R.B. what was going on and then said, find him a place. And they got into R.B.'s uh, car and they drove all around the campus. And when he got to the, the old barn, he said, nobody's using that old barn. Would you like it? And Bill's, first of all, $300,000 would have built a nicer building, but he wouldn't have had any money left over to, to put inside the building. So he was smart enough to say, I'll take it. And he used the $300,000 to start the, the, the laboratory. And that's how it got started, and that's why it's there. Uh, a little anecdote about that is that uh, um, uh, the animal science people had an interest still in that, and I've forgotten the name of the guy who was head of poultry, but he didn't want to see that building go. He had his own ideas of what they ought to do with that, <laughs> and uh, so he moved a bunch of chickens into the uh, to the place there, and he was studying egg production and things related to production of chickens. And Bill Fontaine knew that if that continued, he wasn't going to get the building. <laughs> so uh, he talked it over with Fred Andrews, who, which was, who was a, a good friend, and they decided that they would um, uh, put signs that said irradiated chickens in the lab, and these eggs have now been uh, irradiated, and you don't want to use them. And they thought they would get these guys out of there <laughs> that way. Well, it turns out that the head of the poultry department was smart enough to find out that that, was, that wasn't true, and so he ignored it. <laughs> and Bill they had to do something else. So Bill and the rest of the guys working at the lab started to steal the eggs. <laughs> <laughs> that Anything ruined works. all the statistics. <laughs> so anyway, that's how Bill got it started yeah. there. And just went on from there. Went on from there. Yeah. The first guy that Bill hired at the professorial level, he started with technicians and so forth. Uh, and some profs from uh, mechanical engineering would have a project or something like this. But the first real uh, committed professors to do their research there uh, was first Jack Chaddock, a fellow by the name of Jack Chaddock, who eventually left Purdue and became head of the mechanical engineering department at Duke and had a very successful career, became president of ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating, Ventilating, Refrigeration, Refrigerating Engineers. And, uh, and I was the second one that he hired. And we divided the work that all the thermal sciences Jack Chaddock did, and all the mechanical design and the equipment, I did mm -hmm. all of that stuff. That's the way we divided it. And, okay. uh, and we had some successes, and, uh, and that started us uh, uh, on our way. Uh, I was lucky enough. I was not the only one that, that, that contributed in the beginning. I was lucky enough. Uh, to uh, be able to develop a procedure for, uh, well, a procedure that had a lot to do with the, with the reliability of compressors, because reliability was in the um, uh, cost, initial cost of producing these compressors was of utmost importance, because they were sold to all of the companies that built the whole system refrigerator cabinet, air conditioning, things that went in the windows, all of that stuff. Sure. And after World War II, Ray Herrick decided that a good way to make more money would be to increase the speed of the compressors. Because if he put a motor in the compressor shell that ran twice as fast, then the piston and the cylinder and all of those associated parts, uh, if they're going twice as fast, they can be half as, half as big. And the manufacturing costs and the material costs and 
all of those things would come down yeah, right. and really wouldn't work well. The dynamics of what's happening in those uh, compressors changes considerably when you double the speed. And one of the things that changed, uh, that, that had that, that needed more attention than they knew how to, to handle, were the flutter valves that are analogous to the valves you have in your heart. You know, the compressor and the heart have a lot of analogy. And just like the valves in your heart can fail, these little things can fail. They were going 60 times, opening and closing, 60 times per second. So it didn't take very long to get to the millions of, uh, of uh, 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 cycles where fatigue of the metal starts to be a real problem. And they had had some uh, life testing that they used to subject these valves to uh, when they were uh, had compressors that ran only at 1,800 instead mm -hmm. of okay. 3,600 uh, RPM. And uh, so they would subject all these new designs to those tests. And it turns out, after we worked on this for several years, turns out that the tests that they had for these valves were irrelevant to the fatigue problem. And they had to change those tests. And some of my early students uh, were able to put strain gauges on the valves. And they were the first to do this anywhere in the world. And you could see what was happening when you looked at the oscilloscope to the stresses. And you could, uh, without any additional analysis, you could at the very least compare different designs of valves. And that, uh, not in itself and not by itself, licked the problem, but that got everybody on the way to killing that, that mm -hmm. particular problem. Well, after my students learned how to do this, I became well known all, all, all over the world uh, because uh, everybody wanted to do it. Sure. And uh, without going into any details, that's how I really got started in the uh, air conditioning refrigeration field because of, of that little ex experiment. Something that needed to be looked at and you, were, you came up with it. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's what brought me into Herrick Lab and into some, some prominence. Mm -hmm. But and, how, then you became, you were the director. And well, so when Bill Fontaine retired, uh, and I was doing most of the research of all the profs. And I guess the administration liked to see the money come in for that. And so I was a good candidate to be director and evidently uh, <clears throat> Harry Solberg and the dean and and uh, even Hubdi, they had no, took note of that, and so uh, oh, good. I came back to uh, to a letter from Hubdi that said you're the new director. Very nice. Yeah. And that's that's how that happened. Well, how are the uh, how did the staff increase over time? And uh, you had faculty and uh, students too. Uh, I think, well, I don't remember the numbers well That's enough, okay. but I would say, uh, well, now they have uh, somewhere between 80 and 90 students doing theses there. They're okay. all, all Are they brought more graduate students rather all than graduates, undergraduate? All graduates, all graduate students. Okay. Uh, and we would sell what they were doing to industry. And the companies would sponsor their work and give not only enough money for a fellowship for them, but enough money for the shop and for the experiments, and, some and even some money to uh, relieve the professors from all of their teaching duties. So, so they could work more on the research. So they could work on the research. Well, you, you can't do that with undergraduates. You, yeah. you need commitments. Sure. And so that's how we financed uh, research and the graduate students. And uh, I think at the time I took over, uh, we must have had somewhere around 30 graduate students, 35, I don't know exactly. And we must have had uh, maybe a half a dozen professors directing their work. 
And when I retired and Bob Bernhardt took over from me, uh, we were uh, more than 50 graduate students. And so we had a big expansion during that period of time. And so uh, my tenure as director was to sort of supervise and watch over and nurture the expansion of the Herrick Lab. Right. And now I think they have uh, not 100, but close to 100 people studying there. And they've got uh, maybe a dozen and a half professors who are directing uh, their research. And they have about, uh, well, more than a handful of profs who have their main offices in the, in the uh, laboratories. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a big operation now. It certainly is growing. Big operation. Yeah. And uh, they've been lucky to have a, enough success to be able to continue. And one of the important things that uh, we did uh, when I came back from England, because I, I learned this trick in England uh, because I was in Southampton where they had a major center for noise control for jet engines and that kind of stuff. And uh, one of the things that they did that I really was impressed with is the contact with the uh, British aircraft industry. And they had short courses, and they had uh, small conferences for them, and they did all of those things, and it was wonderful. And when we got back, I got a couple of my farmer students and colleagues. And we put our heads together, and that's what started the, the uh, Purdue Compressor Conference. Which is which going is on. Which is now, what is it, 18th time every other year. Like so that. it's been going close to 40 years. Yeah. And about, uh, well, more than half of that time, the latter half, uh, then one of our professors by the name of David Tree got the idea, let's do the same thing in the air conditioning and refrigeration field, not just the compressor part, but the whole system. So we added the, uh, the uh, air conditioning and refrigeration conference. So what you have now going on as we speak is a combined Compressor and Air Conditioning and Refrigeration Conference, two separate conferences that simultaneously, simultaneously and uh, uh, we now combine the, the uh, papers and it's all one big, uh, big thing now. And I think we have close to 500 people here yeah, that's from maybe more than 30 countries. Very good. And as I look at the proceedings, I, I've not counted them individually, but I think more than half the papers are not American produced, not here in the U.S. And I, not, not North American, but from elsewhere. And I think uh, now from uh, the biggest continent is Asia, Japan, China, Australia, Korea. Those, Korea, yeah. those countries. Yeah. Right. So that's how that started. But the, I wanted to mention those conferences because that had a, a tremendous effect. Uh, had the major effect was advertising the Herrick Labs all over the world. So in this field, if anywhere I go all over the world, uh, people know about the Herrick Labs. And it becomes a place. Uh, there's no other uh, group that does exactly the same thing. It's, it's been a wonderful experience. Very nice to know. Very nice experience. That's right. Very good. Yes. And you were also the first Herrick Professor of Engineering. Yeah. Oh, well, there's, yes, that's very you know, nice. there's stories. I have anecdotes coming out of my ears for all of this stuff. But uh, <laughs> You want to share one with us? Well, uh, it has to do with the Herrick family. Oh, okay. Are there still members of the family alive? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. And the company is still in existence? The company is in existence, but the family is no longer in control of the company. That, that changed a year or two ago. I okay. don't remember the precise date. Uh, but uh, they're in control of the Herrick Foundation, which has stock in the company. Okay. So there's still um, uh, quite a bit of uh, support from the Fa Eric Foundation. But uh, 
uh, how shall I say this? Uh, Ray Herrick retired uh, from being president about the time I got involved. And uh, his son, Kenneth Herrick, was not really the kind of leader that they needed as president of the company. He had other attributes, but not that one. And so they hired other people as president of the company for a while until Kenneth Herrick's son, who was Todd Herrick, uh, became uh, well known enough. So he became the president. So he could take over. And he took over. And uh, when he took over, uh, was sort of in between sometime during my career as director. And in talking to him, I, I said, you know, for a long term, uh, for the Herrick family, you ought to have a chair at Purdue that uh, has the name uh, Herrick on it. And so we had lots of meetings, sure. and at first he didn't know, and then you know, all the, the normal things you hear, it costs too much money and et cetera. But eventually he said yes. And so the Herrick Foundation, which still exists and owns stock in the Tecumseh Products Company, uh, has to give away a certain amount of money. Right. And we convinced them that, uh, that one year, actually it was over a couple of years, uh, that they ought to farm the Herrick, uh, the Herrick uh, uh, chair. And uh, after we got that done, then they had to uh, pick somebody, and, and I got picked. <laughs> yeah, that's very nice. That's very nice, yes. Let's talk a little bit about your awards and honors. You're a fellow in the American Society of Mechanical Engineering. How about the Sagamore of the Wabash? How'd that come about? Was that a, I, others I've interviewed have gotten it, and sometimes they share how they heard about it. Well, it was a big by. surprise to me, so Good. I didn't, I knew it existed, but I never thought I'd be a Was it a special event that uh, you were at? I, well, we have, uh, one of the things Bill Fontaine started that I continued that was worked very well is we have an industrial advisory committee. Good, I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you about that. And, uh, and it was one of the first on the campus here. And a lot of the other ones, particularly the ones in engineering, all were patterned after the one. That's that a good point. That, to make that uh, Bill Fontaine started, and uh, at any rate, they meet formally as a group once a year, and then they have little committees and others that meet in between. But once a year, they have a big, a big deal. This year, I think in October they'll meet. Uh, uh, but uh, I was given the Sagamore at one of their meetings. And the meeting is usually a, a full day or a day and a half of meetings uh, capped off on a Friday night with a banquet. And Saturday, we give them all tickets to the football game. That's the way that works. Uh, and I was running, I was the MC for the dinner on Friday night of that year when I got it. And all of a sudden, I lost control of the meeting. And John Hicks was in the audience, and uh, he came up to the podium and he says, excuse me, Ray, but I have something to, to say and so forth. And he made the presentation at that time. Uh, so uh, it was between Bill Fontaine and John Hicks uh, and those guys that they uh, put me up for Sagamore. And of course, the only reason and the main reason was the, the, uh, the Herrick Labs and the success that we've we had had at the Herrick Labs. Mm -hmm. uh, my contribution back in the uh, to, to the compressor problems were minor yeah. by compared to building the laboratory. Yeah, that's so very nice. I, so I was very happy yeah, for that. That is nice. And you got uh, the Lifetime Achievement Award from these two conferences, didn't you? Which is nice. Yes, yeah, so they. That's very nice. The conferences have been very good in. Uh, in giving awards to people who have had, who have done well in the conferences. That's very good. That's, and uh, because and every once in a while they give what they call a lifetime achievement award. And I spent so many years, <coughs> you know, I was the instigator of the first of these conferences. So, and I and I worked hard for all of them for all these years. That's why they called it the sure, lifetime achievement right. award. Yeah. 
And you've been active in your professional associations, have including the American Society of Engineering Education, which is good. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I have a trouble saying no. <laughs> <laughs> Was that what it is? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but the major ones, uh, the major, the major one is probably uh, uh, what's called ASHRAE. That's the American Society of Heating, Heating Refrigeration. Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers. Right. And uh, what grew out of that was the International Institute of Refrigeration. I was eight years as the U.S. delegate to that body, which has its headquarters in Paris. And uh, and that was a wonderful experience. Oh, I was, just happened to be at the right time. I'm right. A, just worked a, out. I'm a great believer in serendipity, <laughs> and that's what it works. <laughs> that's what it works. Before I became involved in this, I was involved in uh, ASME, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and so uh, I was lucky enough to be invited to be a fellow of that as well. Yes, you are. That's yeah. right. So. Uh, but all, everything I've done of real significance has been with uh, after that. All right. Uh, one comment um, I, for the researchers that the lab is there's a fundraising thing. If you want to just make a comment on that uh, expansion of the facility. Well, um, as they celebrate we, we their got, anniversary we got, this weekend. Yeah. First of all, that's you know that barn was like in the 1920s. I don't remember exactly when it was first built. So. And we kept adding on. So when Bill Fontaine was director, they added those two big wings. That are on either side? On either side. And when I became director, I added the, the wing you can't see because it's behind. The, the one in the back? The one in the back. Uh, so it was. it's an add-on building. And each, if you look at each of those add-ons as a separate building, they were all treated as a separate building. It had their own heating system, their own air conditioning, their own uh, like electrical a separate supplies. Unit. They're really separate units. Sure. And some of them are quite old, you know, 50 plus years old, and they don't work as well as they did when they were new. And so we were always fighting with the physical plant to keep it repaired and and working, and they still fight today, except it's worse today because they're older. Uh, so uh, it became inevitable that uh, something would have to be done. They'd either have to make a major renovation or they'd have to replace it. Well, when President Jiski was hired and they started this plan for the whole campus, as I understand it, the uh, main entrance to the campus now will be right where the Herrick Lab is. So that accelerated the idea of tearing it down. And President Jiski finally said, it's not going to exist anymore. You better start thinking about it. And that was the impetus to start sure. the uh, fundraising for a new building. So as I understand it, the new building is going to cost anywhere from uh, 30 to $50 million, something of that kind. And they decided to to do it in three stages, because they don't need that land immediately. And so they'll build a building that probably is worth 11, 12, 13 million first, right next to where the, orig where the original Herrick Lab is now. And, uh, and On then, the back side? I Not think, at Ryan State? I think it's... Uh, or Ryan State? It's toward the east. Okay. You know where the... Uh, the sort of uh, oval-shaped building is that the grounds people use. I think that's where it's going to be, but okay. I'm not certain. Okay. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that will disappear, and, and I think the new building will go in there. And then they'll add on to sure. that building in two more stages. Okay. So they have a plan, and sure. and I sit in on an advisory committee for it, but uh, but. Uh, I told some of my former students who came to the conference here, I said, uh, it'll happen to you too. Pretty soon you'll be a has-been like I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are you doing in your, tell us about what you've been active in your retirement, what sort of things have you been involved in? Well, um, uh, because of my involvement in the International Institute of Refrigeration, that's the Paris-based thing, which 
which has more than 50 countries. They have country memberships, uh, which really run the organization. Then they have individual personal uh, memberships, which are just to get the, the information to individuals. <clears throat> but because of my involvement in that, and, um, and having been the U.S. delegate to that for eight years, uh, by the time I finished that eight years, I had arranged to have their major conference in the United States again. The second one back in the 1900s, like 19, before World War I, <coughs> was in Chicago. And they hadn't had one here in the United States since then. Hmm. Uh, and, and they occur every four years. Okay. So it's a four-year uh, cycle. And uh, uh, so it's about time we come back to the United States for one of these, because most of the technology at that time was coming out of the United States. And uh, the big problem was to get American industry and the American government, uh, the federal government, to support that. And that was a, a major problem. And, uh, and I took that as a major task to get that happening. And uh, it was interesting because uh, when I went to uh, American industry in this field, they said, well, if we don't get any money from the federal government, we're not going to do it by ourselves. And then I went and go to the federal government, the DOE and all those people. I said, they said, if American industry doesn't want it, we're not going to put any money into it. You know, and it was, became one of those cases. And at any rate, we were able to get them together. And, uh, and I think um, I was smart enough to not chair that myself, but to get industrial people to chair it. So I had one, two co-chairs. One was from the Carrier Corporation, and one was from uh, the top technologist in what's called the Institute of Refrigeration. No, the American ARI, American Refrigeration Institute, which is the uh, industry association for all the people who build refrigerating equipment okay. and their suppliers. And since then, they've now added heating. So heating is in with refrigeration and air conditioning. <clears throat> but I got those two guys to be chair. And uh, Eckerd Grohl, who is uh, the general chair of this conference that's going on here as we speak, he was a young professor that just had started the Herrick Labs. And, and I got him to be my co-chair, and we ran the technical program. So we collected the papers, we had them uh, reviewed, and we did all the work to get the uh, proceedings done and that kind of thing. We did that out of the Herrick Labs, and that was in the year 2003. And even though I moved away in 2001, I would come back to, to the Herrick Labs of, well, a couple times a month, maybe three times a month, and we would take care of all of the details, and we hired a secretary that uh, that did all the detail work. And between the two of us, we we did that, that kind of work. A little anecdote: uh, when we had the wrap-up meeting after after the Congress, the Congress was turned out to be in Washington D.C., and the international meeting afterwards uh, met to have a wrap-up to how did we do and what is important, what did we learn, and so forth. And they called on me uh, uh, to give a wrap-up of my involvement in this. And I said, well, I said, I had the best of all worlds. I said, I had a uh, co-chair, uh, Eckerd Grohl, here, and he did all the work, and I got all the glory. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Oh. So, so it was things like this that I did that brought me back to the campus. Yeah. That's very good. And, yeah, that's um, good. Okay, three minutes. Um, how about an outstanding event in your life? Yeah, one, or Purdue tradition, take your pick, or some closing comments. Three minutes. I got three minutes. Huh? Yeah. Well, the, maybe some closing comments. There, there are a 
for everybody, anybody who's had a career like mine, there are several people who uh, I look back on as having a major impact on me and several event, events. Uh, I would say the main event in my career was when I decided to join the Bill Fontaine in the Herrick Lab. I mean, everything that came after that was a result of that. So other than family, my father, and that kind of thing, I would say that uh, uh, Harry Solberg and Bill Fontaine here, who got me on the right track and brought me into the Herrick Lab, and then uh, Mari Zucro, who was a famous Purdue professor, I became uh, very close to him because my roommate, when I was an undergraduate, married his daughter. So being at the right place at the right time and meeting the right people is wonderful. <laughs> Worked and out. Those, those people had uh, very profound influence yeah. on me. And I tell my students that uh, you want to find somebody who can really look up to and so forth. And I don't know if that answers your right. question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ascensit. Thank you very much, Professor Cohen. <clears throat>